Let's All right. Um, so welcome back, everyone, to our, I have completely lost track, sixth talk in our series. Seven? Wow. Sixth, seventh, eighth? <laughs> um, so whatever number talk in our series on the Mino World after the Mino World Cup, um, today we are joined live and in person by Karim Zidane, um, an independent investigative journalist who's written for the likes of the New York Times, The Guardian. Uh, he's been on HBO Real Sports, CNN. Uh, you get around. Um, <laughs> most importantly, he he has his independent blog, Sport Politica. Um, I highly, highly recommend it. It is well worth your time. Where Karim writes on all sorts of things re relating to sports and politics, uh, everything from football to um, uh, to MMA to racing. Uh, from the Gulf to Russia to Asia, everywhere. Um, and it's along those lines that I came across his work, and he will be sharing us with us today some of that work, some of that thought, some of his own story with regards to uh, the Saudi sports strategy and its evolution um, over the last several years. So, Green, take it away. Thank you very much, and I have my talk is even half as good as that introduction, and I'll consider this to be a successful day. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I'll begin by saying, first of all, I was never a big fan of PowerPoints growing up or in school, so I did not plan one. I'm here to tell you a series of personal stories and just my experiences covering the intersection of sports and politics, investigative journalists, and how it brings it to this sort of evolution of Saudi sports strategy, how it became a global powerhouse in the sport. Really? To begin this story, I'd like to tell you sort of about my genesis into the concept of sports and politics to begin with. So a lot of my friends here, I did not grow up in the West, and a lot of my friends here would immediately ask, and this is a big question to get in interviews as well all the time, how did you get into this? And I'll say, well, it wasn't really much of a choice where I grew up. I grew up in Egypt, and I also grew up in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, but it was really it was really in Egypt when I returned to the age of 15, sometime around 2007, that I fell in love with football. And I realize now I'm in Michigan State, and I should probably call this soccer while I'm here. But yes, it's soccer as, uh, that I really fell in love with at the time. One of my cousins was a very big fan of a, our biggest football club in Egypt. It's called uh, Al Ahli. And Al Ahli really is a is the pride and joy of many, many Egyptians. Chances are, if you ever meet an Egyptian athlete, what your favorite team is, you're going to tell you it's a athlete. Now, it was special to me, particularly because it was the first time for me to go and experience football matches, soccer matches, in giant stadiums. And a these games at the time were played in Cairo Stadium, a stadium that takes about 90,000 people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people that are cheering you on. My cousin was part of this group that had just started in 2007 called the Ultras. Now, there are ultras for all sorts of soccer groups all around the world, really. Some of them are far right and neo Nazi. Uh, some of them are just plain thugs. The ones in Egypt, on the other hand, were really interested. Football or soccer just so happened to be one of the only outlets for us at the time to express ourselves. There was no means of self expression as a young person, as a young man, as a young woman, as, as anybody in Egypt. Uh, we did live under a military dictatorship. We still do live under a military dictatorship. Football was that way for us to express ourselves. And I learned that very quickly as a 15-year-old. I go with my cousin to the stadium, sit in a section called Tantash Mad, which means third section to the left, and the Egyptian. And that section was really the cheapest seats in the stadium. And it was crowded with these ultras. These ultras came from all sorts of uh, classes, you know, for lack of a better term, in Egypt, they were wealthy and they were the, 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 the less, the less well off. But everyone wanted to sit in the same section, this section that everybody could afford because it was a place saying, you know what, we're all united, we're all the same here. Nothing is going to distinguish us. And being amongst that group was an experience I'll never forget. It never got to last very long, but something I really, really will never forget. Uh, for instance, there was a time we were in Ramadan, and we were actually there watching the game. We had to be there so early before breaking iftar, uh, before breaking our fast from that iftar, that uh, some people actually came with drinks for you to have, and we're spreading them around it to everybody had something. And then, there came times of cheering, and <laughs> the, the experience of being in those matches was really phenomenal. But I want to tell you about one specific match. It was Al Ahli versus Barcelona. 
in 2007. This was celebrating at the time of at least 100 year anniversary. And at the time in 2007, Barcelona was on fire. This was a team that just had brought in a young Leo Messi and Egyptians were excited. Barely anyone knew who Leo Messi really was at the time. This was still the team of Ronaldinho, Eto, etc. It's Pep Guardiola's team. And they destroyed us. <laughs> they came and they, they performed like Barcelona. But it was, it was an incredible experience. It was my first time seeing these big superstars on Egyptian soil. It was a wonderful moment for us. Up until the police started pulling people out of our section one by one and beating them with batons. Apparently, we were getting too rowdy. I think there was too many fireworks. There was sort of enough that was driving them crazy that they decided to start pulling us out and attacking us. I didn't get hurt that day, but I did get to see friends of mine and people I knew get attacked with batons for absolutely no reason. I'm 15 at this point. I'm extremely naive and I have no idea really why this is taking place. But I couldn't help but think and realize very, very quickly that this is this is just what sports is like in this world. You can never really escape the political side of it. You can never escape the police brutality that comes along with it and the, the, the sway and the wrath of the government as well. They did not like the fact that we were expressing ourselves or even enjoying ourselves watching the football game, soccer game. This is going to be really difficult. I'm remembering this distinction here. Yeah. Uh, so that, that stuck with me, let's say. And it became even more significant come 2011. At this point, I was studying at the University of Toronto. I got in in 2009. I was in the University of Toronto when the Arab Spring kicked off. When the Arab Spring did kick off, I started to really realize just how important this group of ultras truly were, because they ended up becoming revolutionary figures. These, this was a group that was used to combating with the police. Since 2007, 2007 maybe they weren't ready for the abuse. This was a new team at the time, but between 2007 and 2011, they really honed their ability to fight the police on the streets. That was what they were able to do. And those were the only people the ultras ever really targeted. Their target was very specific. We hate the corruption of the police from coming after you. So when it came time to the revolution, the people actually took to the streets. And when the police started firing tear gas grenades into, into Tahrir Square and into the downtown core, it was the ultras who knew where to guide people. There are significant politicians, uh, one called Hussein Akhanem, who would end up running, becoming the first Egyptian woman to run for presidency. She swore on the importance of the ultras at the time because they personally saved her from just being swarmed by tear gas. That is how crucial a group of soccer fans can actually be in politics and political sphere. The Arab Spring, of course, didn't play out the way we hoped it would play. As a matter of fact, it really didn't succeed pretty much anyway. But it did leave a massive vacuum in the Middle East. And that's really where we come to Saudi Arabia. So the Arab Spring happens and fails. Egypt is no longer the might it once was. Syria is no longer a power. Iraq has already been taken down in that sense. And now is the time of the rise of the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia took a little bit. Qatar announced the 2010 World Cup in Chile, and uh, Saudi Arabia around 2013 had a change in mark. King Salman became uh, the king of Saudi Arabia. His son, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the person we now know as MBS, would eventually become, in 2015, the Minister of Defense of Saudi Arabia. He did two things when he became Minister of Defense. He launched an invasion of Yemen. And he also launched this master plan, let's say, called Vision 2030. This plan for the technocratic future of Saudi Arabia, a divestment from oil, reinvestment in these alternative sectors. So they released this plan. And if you look at it, you see 13 strategic Vectors, sectors that they wanted to target. Amongst them were giga projects like Neon, it's a big giant, uh, I guess we can call it a city that they want to build in the desert. Uh, venture capital investments that they were making. They have invested $35 billion in venture capital funds in the United States. That's as of 2022. I would bet that that's even higher right now. And of course, 
that was sports and entertainment as well. So, by November, by sort of, let's say, let's say by, okay, let's say by November 2017, this is when Muhammad bin Salman really takes, takes a hold of his position at this point. He's continuing to gain influence in Saudi Arabia, and at this point he has risen to crown prince. He has deposed the previous crown prince, Prince Nayef, at his father's request and has been made crown prince himself in what has been come to be known as a palace coup at this point. What he really does at this point in November 2017 is that he arrests hundreds of Saudi royals, ministers, and tycoons who are all detained at the Ritz-Carlton of all places. Uh, quite a swanky prison. But beyond that, the memes that went around at the time and the jokes, the truth is that a lot of these people were reportedly tortured and came under psychological warfare and all sorts of really abusive behavior over a period of a year. People including Prince al Walid, and who was a very, very significant uh, businessman, well-known in the United States and abroad. So what happens over the next couple of years, as we found out, amidst everything else that Saudi Arabia is doing, is that a lot of these people who were arrested were forced to transfer their assets over to the Saudi state and what becomes, you know, as some sort of uh, nationalization project. But really, a lot of this, these assets were filtered through is the public investment fund. Public investment fund is Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund. It was started in the early 1970s, believe it or not, and nobody really came to hear of it until a few years ago. We'll get into that, we'll get into that slowly. But uh, what really happened was just Saudi Arabia really absorbed all these all these assets from these arrested individuals, funneled them in, and created this $800 billion sovereign wealth fund that uh, is chaired by Mohammed bin Salman himself. This becomes the basis of a platform for Saudi's emergence in the world of sports. So what's really, really interesting is while Mohammed bin Salman was sort of uh, you know, consolidating power in Saudi Arabia, really uh, cementing himself as the only uh, authority in the country, uh, silencing the dissenting factions within the, within the government, within the military, within the royal family. What was really interesting to me is that the actual sports strategy part was quite slow to begin with. So I personally, I've been covering sports and politics for a while. So just really, I came out of university and straight away got signed to start writing for six month large website called Bloody Elbow. And Bloody Elbow at the time was known as sort of this outcast in the community. Uh, it wasn't really allowed to really cover UFC events. I was banned from covering them straight away just because we were the most critical of the organization. I made it my task to continue with this type of reporting being quite critical. Then I got an opportunity to start traveling to Russia as a commentator. And it was there that I started reporting on a Chechen warlord, the warlord of Chechnya, Ramzan Kedirov, who at the time was and still is in charge of this semi autonomous enclave uh, called Chechnya. And he had just started purging Chechnya's LGBTQ plus community at the time. This was particularly interesting to me because he was also at the same time starting these fight clubs. It's fight clubs that he was training and having these uh, young Chechen men train and become professional fighters and eventually have them funneled off into the UFC, an American organization. But this was his version of sports washing. Sports washing being this uh, approach taken by, by governments to distract from human rights atrocities and abuses, really. It's weaponizing and harnessing sports as a form of reputation laundering. This was Saudi's, maybe it was Saudi's initial aim, but I'm really here to tell you today that this goes way beyond sports washing. All the same, Saudi's approach really was not the, <laughs> was not the, the strongest start. For me, when it came to Saudi, I remember getting a call from that same cousin who tells me, hey, guess who's interested in buying a lab? That's what I mentioned a little, a little while ago. I said, who's interested in 
He says, well, there's this guy from Saudi Arabia called Turki al-Sheikh. Now, Turki al-Sheikh at the time was the head of Saudi Arabia's general sports authority. Saudi Arabia didn't have a sports ministry, an actual ministry of sports. It's around 2020. It had this general entertainment authority and a general sports authority and had placed Turki al-Sheikh in charge of it. Now, Turki al-Sheikh had no previous government role. He was a poet, and he was one of Ahmed bin Salman's best friends, his favorite people. So it was a great example of nepotism straight out the back. Something that Saudi actually doesn't do beyond its placement of the royal family now. They're very strategic about who they place in authoritative positions in sports. That was not the case then. Kamen bin Salman simply took one of his best friends and said, here, have at it. I don't have time to deal with sports, but we want to get into this. So how about you start figuring things out? So Turkey Shir decides, you know what? I really like this Egyptian team. I've been watching them all my life. Let me go and see what I can do. So in 2017, he decides to fly out to Egypt, and he's given the red carpet welcome. Like in Egypt, we have known for generations, we've been going to work in Saudi Arabia because the economy has been terrible in Egypt. We've known our options were, all right, it's going to be more money to make in Saudi. So if a Saudi person calls you, calls the Latin club and tells them, hey, I want to come and invest. Of course, they're going to roll out the red carpet. That's what we do. Unfortunately, that's just what we do. That's really what they do. When I say the red carpet, there was an actual red carpet for <laughs> him. Like they really, they really went all out. And he arrives, he's, he's just great. He has his sunglasses on. He's very much this eccentric fellow, small guy, eccentric fellow. He arrives, they give him the five star treatment, show him around the facilities. This is a big montage video that's a lovely day to release this. And eventually he does decide, you know what, I will invest. And they make him the. So they sort of give him this honorary role as the president of the land. But they really stress the honorary part. He quickly forgets that. He seems to think that, okay, since I have put in some money here and I've determined I'm going to invest with that land, then I immediately have full control of this club. And over the next few months, he promises a lot. Like, okay, I'm going to bring you these big players. We're going to give you the budget you need. We're going to make you an even stronger club in Africa. I was excited about this. But what is he actually doing? He starts finding players in the land and sending them over to Saudis domestically, hoping in the meantime that nobody will notice, that Egyptians will not notice their favorite club, the only thing left in the country that they still enjoy. <laughs> the only thing left, I'm really not exaggerating here, the only thing that they do enjoy is suddenly going to become uh, complete Saudi, Saudi puppets. He didn't like that at all. He starts butting heads with... Uh, the chairman, the actual chairman of the board, and the actual whole board of directors are really not happy. And this goes on for a few months while tension is building in Egypt itself. Egyptians are wondering why is Saudi Arabia even butting heads at this point. And Saudi, this was at a time of real tension with Saudi Arabia. We had two islands in uh, in the Red Sea called Tehran and Safi. These were what we knew as strategic islands for us, Egyptian land and soil. Our president, Abdel Fattah Sisi, decides to sell that to Saudi Arabia. So this is a very tense point where we're thinking, is everything going to be sold off to Saudi Arabia? Really? So eventually, to skip forward here a little bit, things don't go well for Turkey Sheikh and Talat One day, the ultras were still around at this point, right before they were completely silenced by the government. At this point now, they've been known, by the way, as a terrorist organization. That's how much the current president despises them, labeled them as a terrorist organization. So the fact that you even you know, meet up together could skip with British in prison for life. This is how we chose to silence that group now with those types of uh, charges. Uh, so to these, these fans at the time take to the stadium and start chanting these Really, really horrific insults that took Sheikh, his mother, his family, everything you just don't do to exceptionally powerful Saudi men. He had never experienced anything like this in his life. He takes to Twitter and to Facebook and writes this whole, you know, soliloquy about how disappointed and heartbroken he is about the Egyptian people, these people that he loves so much. How could they treat him this way? And he decides, you know what? You don't deserve my money. But I am going to stick around in Egypt and get my revenge. So he buys this other club in the middle of nowhere, moves it to Cairo, renames it the most original name there is, Pyramids FC. <laughs> and signs, all right, this is going to be the club. And he immediately funnels in tons and tons of money into this club, tons of it. And within a season, this club hits a new record in terms of spending in a soccer team in Africa. 
This seems like a familiar tactic when you start thinking about what Sammy's been doing over the month, over a couple of years now. But at the time, this was brand new. And this was actually really concerning. So many people that they were like, oh, did we do the right thing in here? But Tony Shiv just simply couldn't handle being in Egypt. He didn't enjoy the bureaucracy. He realized he was gaining less influence through, uh, through owning this Egyptian club than he could elsewhere. That's just was with the end of it. Egypt simply wasn't ready to be that swayed by Saudi Arabia. And we, the one sport he really couldn't take over was football. It was too much of a national entity for Egypt. So he decides, you know what, there must be a different way to do this. And there was for Saudi Arabia. At one point, Ahmed bin Salman withdraws to Kishina, brings him back, and makes him the head of the General Entertainment Authority only. Eventually, Saudi Arabia would start its own sports ministry and place Prince Abdelaziz instead of the power of that. Saudi Arabia generally needs to decide at this point, okay, we need to take a different approach to sports, and we need to spread this out, and we need to actually be a lot more strategic about this. This is where I start reporting Saudi Arabia, truly. I did a piece for The Guardian in 2019, showing what they had been doing in 2018 specifically. And here's what they did. Saudi enlisted the services of this U.S. group called the Churchill Group, this international consulting firm to lobby Various different, you know, U.S. sports leagues and companies. Right, according to my records, they met with Bing, Twitch, Madison Square Garden, the NHL, NBA, MLB, and the World Surf League of all things. But apparently, there's a lot of surfing to be done on the Red Sea. <laughs> Growing up on the Red Sea, I promise you, there are no waves. <laughs> but they had to still meet with the World Surf League. But that's really what started getting me thinking. I see now that Saudi's interests are expanding far beyond uh, even the region. And they're expanding into sports and entities that you would not think about. Well, I mean, football, soccer makes sense, really, because it's Saudi Arabia's national sport. And they're actually damn good at it. Asian champions multiple times over. And we just saw in the most recent World Cup, they defeated, so they're the only team that defeated the reigning World Cup champions. And the tournament before, 2018, they beat Egypt. <laughs> so we're just constantly being reminded about how Saudi is spirit to our country at this moment. So in 2018, this is the first sort of big year of Saudi sports watching. Because it's clear to me at this point that they're now investing in U.S. lobbying, in lobbying efforts. Right? They're investing in actual international uh, organizations and sports teams. Like they host something called the Race of Champions. It's one of the first uh, in, in 2018. They hold these world boxing, you know, the super fights, the super series, cruiserweight finals. These are small events for what Saudi's doing now, but at the time, this was a really, really big deal. So then something really, really interesting happens. Saudi Arabia signs a 10-year deal with the WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. I think this really was the, it really remains a very underrated, underreported element of Saudi sports watching and its overall sports approach. First of all, because, I mean, wrestling is not really a sport, it is scripted. It is sports entertainment, but that's actually, in many ways, it's value to Saudi Arabia. The fact that it was scripted actually gave it an extra propaganda advantage for Saudi Arabia. So they host their first event, the first wrestling event in Saudi Arabia uh, as part of this 10 year deal in April 2018. And it's this massive event. And most of it really was an ad for Saudi Arabia. Come visit Saudi Arabia, come visit Rio, come visit Jeddah. That's all well and good. That's all well and good. Saudis are uh, Saudis paid for the event. They paid apparently fifty million dollars per event to host the WWE. That's more than the WWE makes on a WrestleMania event. That's the biggest event that they host every year with over a hundred thousand people on two nights. They make more than that every single time they visit Saudi Arabia. So the incentive is there at the very very beginning. And the incentive is also there to let Saudi Arabia do whatever it wants with the event. And truth be told. 
They didn't just pick us uh, an organization out of nowhere. I grew up watching wrestling, and I learned to love wrestling when I was in Bahrain, actually. So I was in the Middle East for 10 years, and that's what I loved. That's what I loved. Everybody I knew there loved. At the time, it was The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, Stone Cold Steve Austin. These were the big names at the time. So it came as no surprise that when Hamad bin Salman wanted to bring uh, WWE to Saudi Arabia, he when it's, re- it's been reported that the Saudi officials actually requested these big names like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, they wanted people who weren't even alive anymore, because that's what they remember seeing his prints. And this was one of those first attempts for Hamad bin Salman to say, look, I can bring the world to you. I will bring the world to you. At this point, he's already crown prince. He's already reinvented Saudi Arabia in his image, in the image that he wants. And WWE is actually a really useful tool for him. Not only because it was a propaganda show, but it was a way for him to fill an arena and a family friendly environment. It's him showing that, hey, look, there are no women in the audience. There are no families in the audience here. This is not just men entirely, right? But right. he gave him that platform for the extent. At the same time, it was a great tourism platform for them, really. Because those commentators between managers, they were just going on and on about the importance of visiting Saudi, how this country has been reformed. This is a really big point here because this is when Khalid bin Salman was on his reform tour of the United States as well. Every single major outlet wrote about how Khalid bin Salman is a reformer. He is going to change Saudi Arabia. And in many ways, he did change Saudi Arabia. But all these places completely ignored the various human rights abuses taking place in the country, right? Domestically affecting actual Saudis and beyond, right? We'll talk about those in more detail very soon. But WWE Man was a great way to distract from all that to present a country in the image that Hamid bin Salman actually wanted. And it was a great tool for propaganda. As I say again, there was this one time in the first event where out of nowhere, they get these two, I mean, they must have found the only two wrestlers on the roster of Irani heritage, Kurdish heritage, but they brought them out. And this is at a point where Saudi was still in a very intense rivalry with Iran, something that they made amends this year. But at the time, absolutely hated each other. And they bring out these two American wrestlers, but with with uh, with Persian heritage. And they bring them into the stage and then they suddenly bring out these two Saudi wrestlers, these local wrestlers you have never seen before, completely local wrestlers. They bring them in, the crowd is cheering, and they absolutely kick the rest. They kick these Iranian wrestlers' asses. And I'm watching a display of geopolitics in a WWE ring, and it just blew my mind. They really found a remarkable way to utilize the and you know, they've done this before. They've done sort of tongue in cheek play that actually just flat out recreated political drama just because they knew to sell more tickets at different various points and throughout its history. Kind of in some sense, said, hey, we cannot make that work in our advantage. And boy, oh boy, did it continue to make dividends for them. Because a few months later, right, by Yeah, by October 2018, it was that time that Saudi journalist, visiting journalist, and Washington Post columnist, the journal Hashubi, was assassinated and dismembered. Now, at this point, there was a lot of people who started coming out against Saudi Arabia. Big words from a lot of people saying, oh my God, you have to, you can never, this is too much. It's clearly not a reform. This is, who, who dares to tell a journalist to call blood like this? And to a certain extent, people were serious about that. I remember Ari Emanuel, the Hollywood tycoon and power broker who owns Endeavor, decided, I'm going to return this investment, the public investment fund made into Endeavor, a small minority state, because I want to do no business whatsoever in Saudi Arabia. And he says afterwards that he ended up walking around with bodyguards for multiple months simply because he was absolutely terrified by the fact that he returned this money. But the truth is that really nobody else returns any money either. Nobody, a lot of people said they weren't going to do business with Saudi, but when it came down to it, nobody really changed. And that became clear to me when the WWE held its second event just a month later, not even a month. I think it was three weeks later. Despite being contacted by the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Treasury, multiple other 
uh, government entities telling them this is a big mistake, you should probably not be going to Saudi Arabia right now. We highly recommend you don't go. Vince McMahon, the CEO at the time of the WWE, said, screw you, we're absolutely gone. Nothing's going to stop us. We need a commitment to our partner, and we're going to carry out that commitment. Several wrestlers at the time, if I'm not mistaken, were too opted to not go, the biggest of which was John Cena at the time. So it did kind of have a small effect on something. People were clearly uncomfortable with the idea of going and pretending everything was fine in Saudi Arabia, but things clearly were not fine. It's not every day you hear about journalists being dismembered, truly dismembered into 20 pieces. But WWE did return, and they acted like everything was perfectly like nothing had changed, like nothing was the matter. That is sports washing. So when we talk about sports washing strategy, that is where they try to apply it. And it's also not simply to distract the human rights abuses, but it's to make them see one day irrelevant in the context of what we're watching at this very moment. You can still apparently enjoy the show. So many people did at the time. That's how this works. So they went ahead, they held that second show, and guess what? Other sports came with them. Other people came back and continued to hold events. WWE being back, made sure that there was no issues really. Anybody else could now say, well, WWE did it first, right? WWE was here first, so why are you holding it against us? So yeah, by 2019, Saudi Arabia has started making itself really become known as a global hub for sports and entertainment. We're going to skip ahead a little bit here to pandemic, because really Saudi was just getting on a roll. You know, PGA European Tour events, big boxing heavyweight showdowns, then pandemic starts. And everything shuts down. Nothing happens for a long time. But it was really a great regrouping opportunity for Saudi Arabia, because that's when they set up their sports ministry. Actually, fragmenting it and making it really important, giving that authority and that label to Saudi sports. That it's not just a sideshow at this point, it's also authority within another uh, government ministry. It's its own sector worthy of that uh, respect. And at the same time, they started using their major entities, Aramco, the massive oil giant, state owned oil giant in Saudi Arabia, and Public investment fund to sponsor and invest in a wide range of sports events around the world, around Asia, in the United States, and elsewhere. So, according to the Danish initiative called Play the Game, they've managed to map out the vast majority of these investments and sponsorships. And we've they've come to realize that there's over 300 sponsorships. Public investment fund alone has over 130 investments and uh, sponsorship primarily at this point goes to show you just how far this really goes uh, really it's interesting to me thinking about in hindsight now 2020 a lot of, a lot of u.s sports organizations were struggling right everybody relies on live gates they rely on you know, views whatever it may be they rely on you know uh, tv hosting rights etc once there are no sports, well, these companies are due to collapse. And Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, all its initiatives, all its sports, don't really operate in the interest of profit. Really. It's about all these other things, yeah, sports washing, right? About expanding your, your Vision 20, your Vision 2030 blueprint. It's about you know, more power, or politics. It's never been about profit for them. So while all these U.S. entities were weakening, Saudi Arabia saw that as an opportunity to start attacking and invest in a wide range of, of U.S. sports events, really. Things changed dramatically at this point. So a great example of this is when the Public Investment Fund in October 2021 it ma manages to secure an 80% stake in Newcastle United. Newcastle United, at the time, was not really one of the most successful soccer clubs in the United Kingdom, but it was one of the oldest and one of the most recognizable names in the United Kingdom. It is 
to this day a cultural asset in the UK, significant cultural asset in the UK. And yet Saudi Arabia, through its public investment fund that is chaired by Mohammed bin Salman, was able to acquire an 80% stake of this club after apparently giving the English Premier League <laughs> legally binding assurances. That is the quote, legally binding assurances that the Saudi state would not run the club. The question is, how can you really even distinguish that? How can you separate the two entities when the entity that owns the club is chaired by the country's crown prince? The distinction is impossible to make. Yet, what you really learn from this quote of legally binding assurances is not that both well, Premier League actually has something to back up these claims. It's really that Saudi Arabia felt very heavily at this point. They had been working towards buying Newcastle for well over a year at this point. The money was there. Newcastle was struggling as a club. Its fans were depleted, disappointed in what was happening. I think they were 17th in the league, something like that. It was 20 something. 17th in the league at the time, and they were taken over. And they were really delighted about it. There were a lot of fans that were overjoyed by this. I mean, there was all sorts of videos and pictures at the time of them dressed in, you know, Saudi bows, you know, celebrating the table, calling themselves a Saudi club with the Saudi boys at this point. That's not everybody. There are, I know a lot of uh, Newcastle fans were very disappointed by the whole thing. <laughs> but it really is true that Saudi Arabia managed to win over the allegiance of an entire club's worth of fans with one purchase. Absolutely, just one purchase. And this is really where we start to understand the power of football to the sound. The way it was powerful in Egypt, we're going to express how sport and its fans can influence political change and can lead you to a position where the government can actually be a greater. One doesn't really change when we talk about football, about the countries as well, how Saudi fear says. Saudi understood that by Securing clubs the way the United Arab Emirates have done with Manchester City, you win over fans. The difference is the United Arab Emirates' national sport is in football. I mean, it barely is. They, they've had no success in football. What their actual, actual national sport is, is Jiu Jitsu, actually. So Saudi Arabia really it's almost felt like it belonged in the football world. They knew they were a football country, they knew their fans loved it, and they knew they could export that elsewhere as well. While winning over all these all these British fans, right? That's what continues to affect them now. Newcastle, right now, one of the most successful teams in the league. They've made it back to the Champions League. They've done very well while they're in the Champions League. And that's in many ways due to the resources that Saudi threw at the club. And this is why it goes beyond sports washing. Because if none of this was about distracting from human rights abuses, as a matter of fact, when Saudi Arabia completed this takeover of Newcastle United, that's when people started really ramping up the discussion about sports washing. There's actually a, a fan group, a Newcastle United fan group called Newcastle United Fans Against Sports Washing. And if anything, by buying this club, you really bring that key word to the surface a bit more, don't you? The point is that Saudi doesn't care anymore. They've already moved past that era of Jamal Khashoggi. Like I said, in 2018, when Jamal Khashoggi was this member, that would have been the time, above all else, where they would have focused on sports washing. Where it was successful thereafter, and they realize this really does not matter anymore. It's just frankly from human rights abuses that we can actually commit. Abuses, get away with it, move on. We realize that people will still want to come because we have the money. Well, then it just came about power and influence about us. Controlling those narratives. And that really continues to become more and more apparent as we enter sort of late 2022. Right? At this point, Ronaldo signs with Al Nasr. This was a really, really, really big deal. $200 million per year for one of the greatest football players of all time to leave you know, European soccer and to move to the Saudi domestic league. This was a very, very big deal at the time. And it set off a spree of signings of some of the biggest players in the world, from Kevin Benzema to Neymar, for record figures that we have not heard of in the past. Someone who's covered the sport significantly, these are numbers that are just beyond outrageous. These are numbers being thrown out in Saudi Arabia. They have no intention to ever recoup 
It's just not about the money. Once again, it's really not about the money. I really realized this. That's where I'll tell another story. I realized this. Yeah, let's see. In around the same time, actually, December 2022, uh, I was on my way back to Egypt. And when I landed, I found an email. It's an email from somebody I hadn't heard, or heard of before. He responded to me and saying, hey, you know, I just read this article you wrote about Leo Messi becoming a tourism ambassador for Saudi Arabia. And uh, I actually happen to have that contract, if you'd like to see it. And this point, I'm still not too convinced that this is real. I mean, I've gotten all these tips before, but it rarely provides the gold mine that this hand ended up providing. So I get the contract. <laughs> and over the next month, I carefully, before even going beyond to speak to anyone else, go through to try and realize that what I have is the actual contract, that this is real, it might be fooled in any way. I go through the journalistic process of that. And then I reach out to the New York Times, and that's when we started working on the story, because what we found in there was really, really, really important. And I, I mean, for those who don't want to know the details, it's in that New York Times, but to summarize, Leo Messi had a specific deal with Saudi Arabia's tourism authority that valued at $25 million over three years simply to promote the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. To do so was, found, was broken down into a series of pillars. Among those pillars were him simply posting about Saudi Arabia on Instagram. Each one of those posts gets you $2 million. It's only required to do it a handful of times a year, though. It's apparently it takes so much effort to post for two million dollars. Other pillars included him actually going to Saudi Arabia and taking part in promotional campaigns, being pictured in Saudi Arabia. There was a video that was done of him in Saudi for those visit Saudi Arabia campaigns that were done at the time. Another one of the pillars was to go with his family. And the the wording of the contract around some of this is actually quite hilarious because, it, and you must pose while smiling in certain locations. Like, there were some really interesting details for how they wanted this to be presented. It really sh showed just how uh, complex and nuanced this strategy was. They weren't simply thinking about throwing money around, getting a picture taken, like all these other dictators have done over the years. We've seen dictators cozy up with athletes all the time, right? Historically speaking, right? So, so this is nothing new. But, but what they were doing here uh, would, would be a lot of the extents of these contracts and the specific uh, goals that they had to achieve was very, very different for me. The last one was they actually wanted Leo Messi to head a uh, charity in Saudi Arabia as well. <laughs> so he completes all of those and he gets his 25 million over three years. At various points, he's doing different ones. But it was really this tourism contract that helped me understand a lot of what was happening in Saudi Arabia at the time. It really became clear then this was far beyond, as I'm saying here, far beyond the concept of sports washing. None of that. It was for the sports washing aspect. Saudi Arabia's tourism strategy was also not necessarily aimed at North America by any means. Well, Leo Messi is doing great in North America right now. Uh, this was a campaign really aimed at the Arab world, Southeast Asia, the whole different side of the world, because when I was in Egypt, that's where you were seeing you know, Leo Messi on billboards. That's where you were seeing Ronaldo on billboards promoting Saudi Arabia. They were looking to build themselves up as the regional hegemon, taking over from the countries before them that were seen as the places to be the cultural centers of the Middle East. Those cultural centers, for the most part, aren't really the ones in control anymore. Like, think of the traditional powers of the Middle East, from Egypt to Syria to Iraq. It just does not, the really does not count anymore. Saudi Arabia is trying to elevate itself to that position. And securing people like Leo Messi, I mean, this, this, this was clear to me. Even Leo Messi, at the end of the day, he did go to North America. And a lot of people said that that was a big snub to Saudi Arabia. And I immediately had to write an article for the Guardian responding and saying, actually, no, Saudi still gets what it really, really wants. Leo Messi playing in Saudi would be great. But they already have, if, if there are a top 10 there, they have six of the top 10. So they didn't need the seventh necessarily. To, to change anything overall. What they really wanted 
was his willingness to promote the country, his willingness to put his brand on this idea that Saudi Arabia is a place for the visiting. And it's priceless coming from someone like Messi. Like, you ask me, I mean, they got him at a steal of a price. That million is absolutely not. Whoever signed that, whoever convinced Messi to sign that deal, right? It's technically in the contract, but I will not mention who specifically. They made a great, great error. That was way too cheap. So if you think about the millions and millions of people, Messi posts a picture of palm trees in Saudi Arabia, and it gets millions of responses. He's saying, I, can, I can't believe Saudi Arabia is so green. I mean, it's a big, actually, taking a multiple, multitude of ways, but uh, <laughs> uh, really, it's, it's something so simple like that, and and it really is extremely effective. And I challenge you to think of it that way when you're thinking of other sports right now in Saudi Arabia. You see Ronaldo performing. This is great for the Saudi domestic, for sure. It's bread and circuses for Saudi Arabia when you think of the fact that like, over 50% of the country is under the age of 35. Remember what I was saying earlier about football being an outlet for people to speak out? And actually, I grew up not having any outlets to, to voice my opinions, anything to voice rage, disappointment, irritation with the government. If you give a country, if you give your citizens entertainment, distraction, that's what they believe will keep them docile. And that's what Mohammed bin Salman wants to do for the most part, keep his population docile and happy. And in many ways, they are, depending on who you ask, a lot of those people are far happier now than before. It does differ, it does vary depending on who you ask, but the Saudis that I know, a lot of them tell me, well, a few years ago when you were living here, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do this, unless we just so happy to know some people who lived in the Aramco compound. So that's, that was the only way it really worked. Now, on the other hand, they can go out. They don't have to wear a hijab. When my mom lived in Saudi, she was forced to wear a hijab. That's not something she wanted to do. It should be a choice whether you want to or not, right? But it wasn't in Saudi Arabia. Now, it depends on what they want. Uh, I have a friend, I'll say this, I have a friend who is a party promoter. He's been, the, he's been doing that in Egypt for a very, very long time. He's fantastic at it. He switched and started promoting parties in Saudi Arabia. I ask him why, he says, Better there, there's less government bureaucracy, uh, there's less issues to deal with, and the drugs are better. <laughs> Those are the answers. So the country has changed dramatically, absolutely dramatically. But at the same time, like I said, there are elements of uh, services, there's elements of a much larger geopolitical society here for Saudi Arabia. So let's use some of the examples from things that they've achieved this year. Earlier this year, we find out that the PGA Tour has decided to merge with the Saudi-owned Live Golf League. They call it a merger, but it's actually a hostile takeover when you really think about it. What actually happened was Saudi Arabia poached a bunch of PGA Tour's top players, offered them far more money, and litigated very, very, very heavily against the PGA Tour with threats of antitrust litigation. Mind you, I'm valid, that antitrust uh, litigation. I don't quite know how that changes with a merger. But really, this was a hostile takeover. It has not been fully completed as of yet. We have to wait till December 31st to see if it will be completed. And as of right now, the regulatory pushback hasn't been significant in any way, shape, or form. It really hasn't. We have seen a Senate subcommittee attempt to investigate this uh, with Richard Blumenthal in, in, at, the, at the head of it, asking some very important questions, but I don't quite see how they can stop it from happening. It could capitulate entirely if both entities don't come to significant agreements on how golf is going to be operated. But this is neither here nor there at this point. What I really want to state from that is we just witnessed an American pastime get taken over by a Saudi entity just like that. Just like that. There was nothing they could do about it for years. The PGA Tour resisted Saudi Arabia. As a matter of fact, Saudi, when they first approached the PGA Tour, they approached them saying, you know, we just want to invest in you guys and partner with you. PGA Tour said, yeah, no thanks. But they regret that decision now. <laughs> 
and it goes on. The list really goes on and on. I don't want to bubble you down with tons and tons of examples of what Saudi has achieved this year. But I mean, you go and take a look at the fact that they have the public investment fund has, has invested, bought a majority stake in Saudi Arabia's four top uh, domestic uh, clubs in Michael Malad, which are the Hayat al Nasr, etc., and just filled them with extraordinary amounts of players. Elevating this league to becoming one of the most significant in the world in a matter of years, right? And not even less than an entire year. Whether this succeeds long term, we'll find out. And to finish on the most significant one today is the fact that they were able to secure the 2034 World Cup. They managed to secure the World Cup without a vote. There was no voting process. I remember. The outrage in 2010 over the Qatar one, because the whole when everyone was talking about bags of money and all these different things. Well, Saudi skipped all that. Skip all of it. Ideally, Hamid bin Salman would have loved the 2030 World Cup. And there were whispers about that. There were whispers about this in Egypt as well, because once again, Saudi for some reason couldn't resist staying away from Egypt and apparently wanted to partner with Egypt and Greece for a World Cup in 2030. Never worked out. The bids were far stronger for the alternative option. And FIFA decided to sway Saudi against that. And as we see how it played out, they said, listen, it appears to me that this is how this played out. Uh, step aside for the 2030 World Cup and we'll help you secure the 2034. And as we see, there were really no competition whatsoever when they made the 2030 World Cup, one that included so many different continents. Well, you eliminate those continents and those confederations from eligibility for the following World Cup leaving you with bids that were allowed just simply from Asia and Oceania. That's it. With Australia falling under Asia rather than Oceania. And Australia, uh, this bid was, I think they changed their mind on whether they wanted to go to or not, or wanted to uh, enter into the fray, and voila, suddenly Saudi was the only option there was. And they secured a World Cup just like that, making themselves utterly inevitable. Absolutely and utterly inevitable. So when we talk, and, man, and mind you, there was barely a mention of human rights abuses or sports washing at the time, because Saudi Arabia has just normalized it at this point. We can go beyond simply the discussion of human rights abuses. There are plenty of them. There's plenty of them all over the world. But to me, when someone insists on continuing to discuss Saudi sports in terms of sports washing, I think it is lazy and incomplete and simply does not apply now. When it comes to Saudi Arabia, we have gone so far beyond sports washing. Sports washing apply maybe at the time of Khashoggi or before that, Muhammad Salman was still pretending you know, to be a reformer. Now they simply don't care. Yeah, they know that money is what's going to matter here right now. They know the, the vast majority of the world's sports league are in pursuit for profit. It's how you operate in a capitalist society, and Saudi has much more of those resources than anyone else in the world. So that's what they're doing. They're utilizing that specifically. For Saudi Arabia, it's not about sports washing. It's about power. It's about prestige. It's about controlling global narratives. It's about making yourself inevitable. They succeeded. Thoughts, interactions, questions. <laughs> what have you got? I know you touched on this slightly about like the like I don't talk a lot about like, sports watching outside of Saudi, but what about like within the region? Um, like the pushback and stuff. Like I grew up inside, but I grew up in a very, very small town. And so, like I remember when they opened up like the Jawahar Stadium and like, Jeddah, and like women were finally allowed in like the family section to go and stuff like that. Like in Jeddah, it seemed very like it was slowly getting normalized. But I came from a very small town where there was more pushback from the citizens. And I haven't been in like the past five years, so I was wondering how that has changed in regards to like these bigger stuff. Because like Jeddah, Riyadh, like Jubail, all of them are. are Kind of like you know their population is a lot more, but I don't know the other places. That's why that's why I did mention I love I like that question a lot, but that's why I did mention that it really depends who you ask, right? In these countries, it depends because there's always going to be a segment of society that's thriving and benefiting. And if you're if you happen to be asked one of those people, of course you're going to get a 
incredible answer. I have met and, and spoken to multiple times uh, Lina Tatu, for instance, who's, who is the women's rights activist. And if you haven't heard of her, I highly recommend you look her up and, and listen to some of what she has to say about Saudi Arabia right now. She's the sister of Lujain. And Lujain was a women's rights activist as well, was also arrested and thrown in jail in Saudi Arabia at the time when Thomas Salman was presenting himself as a reformer, because to him it was like, I'll give you right, but I'll give you the rights that I feel like giving you. Stop asking for extra things. So yeah, Lujain was thrown to jail for that specific reason, really. And eventually with Western uh, pushback and pressure and just world pressure applied in general, uh, she was released, but still is under travel ban. Saudi Arabia. There are still executions taking place regularly, and it's the people who are being executed are not just you know, criminals of what sort of truck, but these would be some of the Bedouins who have pushed back against the, the, the creation of new, Neom, for instance, right? There are lots of people who are being, this is what's way worse than standard gentrification, right? This is completely annihilating people's generational homeland to build some sort of megalomaniac project at the end of the day. So of course there's going to be pushback. I must stress that there is pushback, but it really depends on who you ask at Saudi Arabia and finding those voices. Much like it would have been very difficult to find the voices in Qatar who were critical of what was taking place because either a minority or they're just, uh, they're, you know, overshadowed by the majority of voices that you would generally hear. Saudi Arabia is having the same thing right now as well. You're struggling to find enough nuance and people willing to discuss the issue because of course it comes with its own intimidation and issue. There are people who would tweet from anonymous accounts in Saudi Arabia, anonymous accounts that have 20, 30, 40 followers. It's enough an account at the end of the day. And they tweet their concerns. Saudi has been arresting those people and putting them in cruel, utterly cruel, abhorrent 40, 37 year uh, sentences four tweets <laughs> that's even worse than we do in egypt and that's really saying something that's really saying something like you have to yeah so again that's a great reason why somebody would not speak out why would you speak out if it means more jail time if you're out of the country that doesn't that doesn't suddenly free you up to speak because if you happen to have family back home well they still have a grip on you one way or another you might speak out you might be free to do so but they will absolutely punish your family to bail to them so yeah, that's the problem, I think. Um, so you mentioned how kind of Saudi kind of like bought their way into like the Bahi and said. And so you mentioned kind of like the reactions that like the Egyptians had towards that versus like the Newcastle fans had towards that. So why do you think the reaction is so different? Do you think that like Egyptians kind of knew what Saudi was trying to do or like <laughs> Okay, so Initially, I'd say the very, very first few days, like when I was talking about the red carpet. So what, those opening days of bringing Toki shit, and when we just thought this was going to be free money coming in and it would have come with no control or no say from them, I think a lot of Egyptians were fine with it. A lot were really fine with it. Some people now, you ask some of that fans now, they're like, ah, we should have taken some more money. <laughs> we should have taken some of that money. But no, generally, I think the fact that Egypt had gone through the Tehran Sanafir incident, actually losing land, something that this to this day, you, you mention these points to an Egyptian, and these are very, very sore points. Let me tell you, actually, you know what? I'll give you a story that actually plays this out specifically. I was in a taxi just a few weeks ago in, in Egypt, and you know, whenever you're in a taxi, it's a great time to have a conversation. You'll truly get the, the, the temperature of what's happening in the country. And the conversation turns to Hamad Salah. Hamad Salah, a big football player from, or soccer player from Liverpool, the Egyptian. It's like, you see, it turns to me, he says, you see, uh, Mo Salah is going to uh, Saudi Arabia. I'm like, hang on, hang on. I don't want to say I'm a journalist. I tend to not say I'm a journalist. This is just like a, like a rule. <laughs> so I turn to him, I act like I don't know something. <laughs> And I say, well, what did you do that impression? He's like, oh, that's funny. It's Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> What do, you, what do you mean? He's like, did you see, they bought like guy's eyes. I'm like, they, there's no guarantee they're going to they're going to buy set, they're going to buy Hamas. So he's like, yeah, but you know, they bought, they buy everything in Egypt. You know, they buy everything. They bought Tehran and Sanofi. He actually mentions the <laughs> island. He actually mentions. I ended up writing. It inspired me so much that conversation. Actually, I wrote a whole essay using that as the intro specifically because it blew me away that he was referencing Saudi's inevitability of buying 
are, are taking our top players by using the precedent that had already been set of, well, they bought our land, so why wouldn't they buy an athlete? That's really how I think of it in general now. They've got that kind of influence. To me, it's not strange that they're buying or attempting to invest so heavily and you know, exude this type of influence elsewhere because they've been doing it in the region beforehand. Right? They are far more in control in the region than Egypt is right now. And that's really saying something, because Egypt used to be uh, you see, America's leading ally in the region under the people born of rights in the Arab Spring. So much has shifted, and the region has shifted, the politics of the region have shifted, and sports are simply one way to magnify the changes taking place, rather than it uh, being, the, or being the, the, the issue that drives change necessarily. Uh, I guess, like, what role do you think that, because Qatar hosted a World Cup, that Saudi Arabia felt that, like, it's a regional rivalry that they also have to host a World Cup and that, like, in some ways they, they need to make a bigger, like, spectacle, I guess. Do you think that they would try to host the World Cup in the same way if Qatar didn't do it first? I, guess. I think I think you make a great point in regards to the regional rivalry and the fact that I absolutely agree that Saudi Arabia sees its... It's regional competitors now in Qatar, the United States Arab Emirates, and also Tottenham. So, yeah, Qatar hosting a World Cup in 2010, 2028, 2022, that's really, really significant. When you think of the fact that the entire region had a blockade on Qatar, so just a couple of years before the World Cup, slowly fizzled out when they realized, I mean, the UAE at one point was trying to get FIFA to switch hosting the World Cup from, from uh, Qatar to elsewhere. They were trying everything they could to sabotage this World Cup. When they realized they couldn't, and that Qatar, in that case, seemed inevitable, they instead slowly fizzled out this blockade and started partnering up with Saudi Arabia, or started partnering up with Qatar. By that, I mean there was a lot of tourism to be had. The United Arab Emirates opened up its uh, flights, in and out daily flights to, uh, to Qatar, right? There was all sorts of relationships to be had there for them to take advantage of that world cup so they didn't want to miss out now that saudi sees that that happened and that you know qatar was able to succeed and emerge at this point for qatar this was a bigger deal than than for saudi or the united arab emirates which were both more established in the world stage than qatar qatar has played a role in as we're seeing right now negotiations between Hamas and uh, israel and stuff like that but beyond the, that type of role, we've never really, it's not a country that's well known, right? But they, they became so after the World Cup. That was their pri primary goal, achieving that level of influence, right? Breaking the blockades is a great example of that. Saudi Arabia wants to host the World Cup because it would be the culmination in many ways. Had he done this in 2013, he would have presented this as the culmination of this 15 year or whatever uh, strategy that he has presented, this 20 vision, vision 2013 master plan. So that's, I think, the one way or another, we were going to see Saudi Arabia aim to host a World Cup. But I absolutely think the rivalry plays out in cross sports. We just saw Saudi Arabia uh, host a boxing match between Francis Ngannou and Tyson Fury. It's a big, big crossover spectacle. And the way they held this boxing event, it's like nothing we'd ever seen before. Ring coming out from under the ground, all the celebrities of the world gathering. All that taking place in Saudi Arabia, right? Why would they start really investing in combat sports when that's not really, in any way, Saudi's national identity? When I come to think of the group, if Egypt has more influence in combat sports than Saudi Arabia does, but you know what? The United Arab Emirates is the place that has presented itself as this hub for combat sports over the years. It is jiu jitsu, like I mentioned, it's a national sport of the United Arab Emirates. It was, it was Sheikh Tahnoun, the son of the founder of the UAE. While he was studying in San Diego, he watched the very first UFC event in 1993 and fell in love with the sport and decided to start training in jiu-jitsu. He ended up training with Henzo Grace, one of the most renowned uh, jiu-jitsu black belts there is, and a member of the Gracie sort of uh, uh, legendary family of, of jiu-jitsu. He returns to the United Arab Emirates and says, you know what, this sport has so much potential. And he basically creates this Abu Dhabi Combat Club, which ends up hosting 
the most prestigious jujitsu tournament there is. He professionalizes the sport, creates weight categories, etc. And all of that now takes place in the United Arab Emirates. Abu Dhabi is the center of jujitsu of Brazil. It's called Brazilian jujitsu, but it's actually the center. The home is in the UAE, right? And up until very, very recently, the exclusive home of UFC events in the in the Middle East region, the Middle East and North Africa region was the United Arab Emirates until Saudi decided that it wants to also get a piece of the pie. They could have left the UAE alone to be the leading combat sports entity. They could have they could have taken all other sports and left them combat sports. But even that Humphrey Salman doesn't want to do. Especially now there's a significant rivalry between uh, MBS and MBZ and MBZ being Mohammed Zayed. They used to be Mohammed bin Zayed used to be Hamid bin Salman's uh, mentor, even let's say. When he was Minister of Defense, he relied heavily on Hamid bin Zayed during the initial attack and invasion of Yemen. Some have even said that, he, that Hamid bin Zayed led Hamid bin Salman on a little bit because I mean, you see the reaction now of Hamid bin Salman was trying to withdraw from Yemen while Hamid bin Zayed and his coalitions continued to fight in Yemen, right? So the UAE is no, uh, the UAE, we cannot ignore how significant the UAE is in the space as well. We really cannot, right? They're also, they have the advantage, I think, that in many ways, uh, Canada gets next to the United States. The United States gets all the attention. It's all the attention. Well, Canada could have just the same amount of controversy and will only get a small fraction of that. Why? Because the USA absorbs all of that. Saudi Arabia absorbs what's the UAE should be getting in terms of controversy as well. More people recognize Saudi Arabia, more people know what Saudi Arabia has done in general. That's just how it works. The UAE is, the UAE is involved in all sorts of conflicts right now, horrific conflicts. It's also one of the countries leading in uh, spyware, spyware that's used to target dissidents, activists, journalists, right? And yet they get away with so much of that, right? So yeah, that rivalry I expect will really continue and flare up across various sectors, whether it be in the political sphere or in sports. So one of the things that, uh, I mean, I have many questions, but we're going out later, so we can chat. Uh, uh, but um, you mentioned how the ultras on Alawi, uh, they, they kind of pushed out Tarekashi, right? Is there a way for the world to kind of take that on to do something against Saudi? Is it even worth it? Or is that entirely missing the point? I mean, are, are they just inevitable, as you said? Maybe I'm I'm just a particularly skeptical period in my in my writing right now. I do sense them to be inevitable, especially as I sense. Even right now, you, it's going to be hard to convince, to get on more personal, it's going to be hard to convince a lot of the world to react to some of these human rights abuses as if they are exceptional, when even the entities that are accusing them of human rights abuses happen to also portray extreme human rights abuses and carry it to a double standard as well. The United States, the UK, these countries are losing a lot of the authority they once claimed to have had even to discuss human rights abuses. That, I think, is going to be a factor in the discussion moving forward, that less people are going to even be interested in hearing the human rights uh, concerns coming out of these countries, even though I think there is a way for us to have a more nuanced discussion about it. It's very difficult to do so right now, I think, basically what's going on in the world in front of us. Uh, that, I think, is going to really factor into it. Until then, I do believe regulatory pressure is going to be important. Like I said, the PJ Live Golf field, as much as it felt inevitable, as much as it appeared to be a hostility, but it's not complete. There are ways for that to fall apart. There are ways for the, the, the US government to even pursue antitrust litigation afterwards. They can make life difficult for Saudi Arabia. But right now, I don't see a country or an environment that wants to make life difficult for Saudi. Like I mentioned, Saudi has invested $35 billion in venture capital funds. In the United States, that's more than they've invested in sports worldwide. So according to my calculations, I don't think so far they have spent more than $20 billion on sports. So that is me really giving them like an extra, an extra boost right there. Yet they spent far more on other things in the United States. Nobody seems to care. Yeah. It hasn't, you know, hasn't raised any concerns, any alarm bells. 
all this lobbying that they're doing here. It's not bothering anybody. So why would sports be exception, fortunately? As long as we continue to preserve mm -hmm. it as the primary incentive for doing anything, well, then you will always fall in the hands of the entities that have the most money. In this case, right now, Saudi Arabia. Questions? Um, so I'm not that like familiar with golf, but when you mentioned it, I thought it was very interesting because you're saying that like senators are getting involved trying to stop it. Why are they trying so hard to stop it? Like why aren't they just kind of letting the Saudis get involved in golf? Like what's the big deal? Is it because it's an American Passover or is it because they just don't want Saudi to have even more power in sports. Well, of course, it depends really on, on the senators. Some have come out flat out and said that the U.S. government shouldn't be getting involved in these deals between, uh, between private companies. So it really depends on the senators. That's actually the statements coming from Republican senators so far. Uh, Democrats also have been wishy-washy on this, believe it or not. But, but Lutenthal in particular has been, has been really good at emphasizing, well, we don't know the extent of this agreement. We, don't understand. we want more transparency on how this came to be. And yes, if somebody is going to take over an American pastime, mm -hmm. we need to understand how this came to be and what this means for the sport moving forward. Right? And there were, of course, the concerns of how it was going to be operated, whether the Saudi state was going to be involved, human rights concerns and all that were mentioned. Yeah, it's 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 unclear where that's going, but I do we do owe him a bit of credit because the discovery that came along with uh, his investigation led to the release of documents that have been a treasure trove to people like me. I would not have even been able to see that framework agreement had it not been for uh, for for that investigation in the first place. That framework agreement was particularly interesting because it showed a uh, non disparagement clause in it as well that was added in the fourth draft. Stipulating basically this, I mean, there were very little details in that framework agreement about how they were going to proceed as a company. <laughs> but yeah, they already had enough space to say, no, no, but there's going to be a disparagement clause that says nobody can say anything bad about Saudi Arabia. Yeah. That, by the way, I forgot to mention, but that was in the uh, Messi's uh, tourism contract with Saudi Arabia as well. There was a clause specifically stating that he could not tarnish Saudi Arabia at any point. Whatsoever. That's how they control the global narrative. It's no longer about, it really generally isn't even about physical intimidation with Saudi Arabia. Trust me, I have faced physical intimidation covering dictators in the past. I've gotten threats from people like Rakan Kadiro. I have never been approached by Saudi Arabia. And if I do, I would expect it would be litigation rather than anything else. That's what I would uh, expect. So the same thing falls, that's, that, that's the kind of information that comes out of the uh, uh, his investigation. So at least there's been some useful elements, but it's not clear where it's going to go or how many people are going to get behind it. And your assumption is that this disparagement clause exists in probably all of these sporting contracts? I would love to get my hands on more of them to find out. That is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately because it seems to me that this is how Saudi Arabia is going to control the narrative. It seems to me that when you see Neymar uh, posting about Saudi Arabia, well, I'm always going to think in the back of my head how much was paid for that post. Right? How genuine is that post? Or is this part of the whole it's part of the whole game here? Because really, Saudi Arabia, when you think about what they're doing, I mean, it's great having Ronaldo score goals for them. It's great having this sort of mass appeal for, for the Saudi youth. But then they end up putting him in these ads. Like on Saudi National Day, they presented uh, Ronaldo and various other members of the Al-Nasr team dressed in Saudi thugs and, you know, dancing and the folkloric dances and singing. And that's a wonderful moment for Saudi nationals who get to get to have the sense of pride in themselves. Again, part of, part of the strategy used by the government here is to grow this new version of Saudi nationalism. That's perfectly fine. Lots of countries do this. And in many ways, it's to export it abroad as well. So it's it's brand management. It's not even reputation laundering. It's brand management at this point. It's PR 101 for Saudi Arabia. That's what they're using these players for. They're walking PR ads for Saudi Arabia. That's their primary concern. It's not even scoring goals. It's PR. Yeah. I think especially like somebody like Jordan Henderson. Right? Exactly. Oh my goodness. What a what a success for the, the backlash on yeah. Jordan Henderson. But again, that was one of those examples. I feel like Saudi at certain points sometimes. It's just trolling people now. Why do we even take a Jordan Henderson? It barely matters to 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 
It wasn't even for one of the main four clubs that they had invested in. It was club number five. Yeah. Like they bought, they take Jordan Henderson, who's a, 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 a former player for, for the Liverpool. He's the Liverpool's captain. He was also on the on the England national team. And he was a well-known advocate for LGBTQ plus rights. He would regularly wear armbands and be very supportive of the community. Him going to Saudi Arabia ended up leading to a massive backlash in the United Kingdom with with uh, queer fans saying, this is extremely disappointing. We feel that you just played us over this time. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, you know, to question that. If you feel that way, I mean, it does seem to be that now that he said the can't, he is this there, he can't do that anymore, or chooses not to do that. But yeah, then it does feel like it simply was a way to build his brand as well. Very disappointing overall yeah. when it comes to Jordan Henderson, but I would not be surprised again if he has one of those clauses saying he cannot tarnish Saudi Arabia. And for them, I can imagine wearing those bands or promoting LGBTQ plus rights, which even in Egypt and elsewhere in the region will still be considered Western ideologies, etc. I roll my eyes as I say, "Oh, this disappoints me to even say it out loud." But yeah, that's that would fall under tarnishing Saudi Arabia for them. So um, you just mentioned that, you know, with regard to human rights, there are other different countries have issues with that. So away from that, what's wrong with Saudi Arabia doing all this for, for, for sport or for just, you know, dominating itself? Well, it absolutely changes, fundamentally also changes the nature of a lot of the sport entities, right? You, when you... When you uh, Think of the same way you think of real estate. It's like someone coming in and saying, well, what's wrong with a country or a government entity in a country coming and buying up a bunch of our land, building housing here, etc.? Well, it changes, it creates a housing bubble, right? It changes who can live in there, it changes the housing affordability. It's happening all, all across North America. We've seen the UAE invest into Manchester and saying that this is part of their, you know, investing in the community since they own Manchester City. Why not invest in the community? But the problem is, is that they built, they, they bought the land for extremely cheap, and then they built expensive housing, and they're the ones who make money on it. So they gentrified the area for profit, for investment. So say we forget the human rights of yourself. Mm. They still are, as a corporation, acting as a corporation, working in their interests rather than the interests of the community. So this applies on a local basis across sports as well. Right? And it is sports at itself. So when you think of Saudi could probably do the same thing in Newcastle. Right? But even when we talk about the league overall, when you have this much money being thrown at players that are well past their prime, right? It creates a bubble that most of the world cannot keep up with. And it starts elevating the value of the player beyond what it should be in football. Thereby, even in the future, we want to host more events to expect bigger spectacles, which will lead us into the hands of the only nations able to build stadiums and do things like that without bureaucracy, which will always be authoritarian machines, unfortunately, right? That's why the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, always targets countries like that, countries that don't have citizens who can say, no, that's not what we want in our neighborhood. Right? Yeah. So beyond human rights, the sports themselves will have an impact on all of us, our communities, out everywhere. That's true. Um, you mentioned like a palace coup that occurred, and um, I wasn't like wasn't aware of that. Um, so that was new information to me. So he forced like Saudi royals to put money in this investment fund. Why, if they're Saudi royals and they have some kind of like entitlement in the country, who gave MBS all of this power? Like, how was he able to execute this? Because if I was like a Saudi royal and like one of my fellow royals tried to do that to me, I'd be like, what are you doing? Like, the, I have power too. Like, how did that occur? How did he get so much power? So this will definitely be a, a question for somebody who is more tuned to specifically Saudi politics, but mm -hmm. based especially on the discussions I've had with other Saudis and, and, and people over the, over the years, if this is why it didn't happen suddenly, you know, sort of instantly, right? His, his father becomes uh, becomes king, the king Salman, right, in charge, 
and then he slowly elevates Hamid Issa, and first to the position of you know of, of uh, Minister of Defense, then slowly bringing him into the role of the Crown Prince. Once he's there, he begins to solidify, he begins to consolidate various segments of the country. When it comes time to actually arrest these royals, the accusation that goes at them is that he is attempting to reform the country. Uh, from its corrupt, from corrupt officials. So King Salman himself raised out this uh, statement, and we have the statement here actually somewhere. So that use the actual words. Yes, it was a crackdown on corruption. So again, all these arrested Saudi royals, well, they were accused of corruption. So prove that you weren't corrupt. That's what it becomes about, rather than how dare you do this to me? Well, you've been you've fallen under these accusations still, and we're trying to eradicate corruption across the board. But really, what well, critics really what ended up saying was that this was a move simply that Hamid bin Salman was attempting to consolidate power. Beyond that, because of the lack of transparency in these situations, it's still very hard for us to, to know exactly what went down here. Even when it comes to the, the public investment fund, the reason we know so much of the money had to have been transferred to it is because even in their own grasp, when you see the growth of the investment fund, 2017 and 2018 are those big years. But 2019 had taken such a massive boost. And it was in 2019 when the Saudi government announced that a significant amount of the people who were in the Ritz Carlton had been willing and agreed to transfer their assets over for a significant portion of their assets while listing some of those people, including Prince Alba. So that was basically how they got their freedom. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. Hey, um, this has been such a great conversation. Uh, thank you so much, Kareem, for sharing your stories, for sharing all of these insights. Um, again, I would say subscribe if you're able to to the blog. Uh, it is full of all of these insights. <laughs> um, weekly, even more than weekly sometimes. Oh, yeah, I like to do it a couple of times a week where I have time. Yeah, we'll yeah. be doing more podcasts and stuff on there as well. Yeah, I'm looking for people to start contributing to it as well because it's only so much I can write and there's so much happening around the world all the time. Well, there you go. Um, and then next week, we will have uh, Nia Borja um, over Zoom. She'll be speaking on the post-spectacle city, the politics of space, nation, and multi-species belonging after Dubai Expo 2020 and the 2022 Qatar World, World Cup. So shifting topics, but very much still uh, on our general theme here. But I'll be, I'll be, I'll be. Yeah, that's all right. right. Watching that. that's really good. <laughs> all right. So thank you again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>